Happy Tuesday, everybody. It is April 2nd, 2024. The Gamecocks have held their sixth practice of the spring. Wrapped up this morning. We had a chance to listen to Shane Beamer speak to the media. And they're back at it. They're back at it. They had Easter break this past weekend. Hadn't practiced since Thursday. And Beamer came out today and said that he was pleased with how things went. And that's not always the case when you're talking about coming back, whether it be from spring break, whether it be from Easter break. Sometimes guys come back and they're easing back into it. That wasn't the case today. Beamer said the tempo was high. There was a lot of situational periods. There was a lot of red zone periods. Energy was high. Didn't look like a team that's been off for a couple of days because of Easter break. So we'll get into some of the things that Shane had to say today because a couple of things in particular stood out to me. A couple of things in particular stood out. He talked about the competition at quarterback, how that's looking. Talked about the expectations he has in particular about that room heading into their first scrimmage this Saturday. They'll have SEC officials there. They'll be live tackling. The quarterbacks, though, Beamer admitted today that he's still going to talk that through with the coaching staff to decide what they ultimately want to do because in years past, there's been some quarterbacks who are live. Sometimes there's not quarterbacks that are live. Sometimes all the quarterbacks are live. Sometimes not every quarterback's live. So that was one of those things that he mentioned today heading into Saturday's first scrimmage that he's not sure about quite yet. So we'll hear from him on that as well. Talked about Nick Harbour, how he continues to be pleased about how he's handling, juggling what feels like eight different things right now, being a student athlete, right? Running track and field, but he's continuing to come into the building for football whenever he can. He was at practice today to watch, of course, Harbor with running track and field. He's not participating in practices or football, but he continues to be there and continues to do extra things on his own. We'll listen to Shane and hear what he had to say about that as well. Another thing, too, that we asked Beamer today was about the transition with Joe D. Camillus. We know his football background. We know what he's been able to do from a special team standpoint in the NFL over 30 years of coaching in the NFL. But anytime there is any type of change, right? I mean, it could be work for crying out loud, whatever the case may be. When you have a change, verbiage can change. Expectations, expectations, of course, are high, but the way things are done from a technique standpoint, there's a lot of change that can take place. So, Having Beamer answer that question today was good as well because we've heard a lot about offense and defense, and certainly I get it. That's the sexy thing that you're going to talk about. But as we all know, especially when it comes to South Carolina football, since Shane Beamer arrived, special teams is very important, very important around these parts. And when you look at what South Carolina did, especially those first two seasons when they had a lot of success, special teams played a big part. That's why USC was ranked number one in special teams efficiency two seasons ago. They're trying to get back to that point this season. Having said all that, it's April 2nd. We're just under three weeks away until the spring game. And I think naturally we want to see what Sellers is going to be able to do in that game. But to me, there's so much more. I want to see what the wide receivers are going to look like. I want to see the competition at cornerback. Positions that you can really take something away from in these spring games. Beamer's talked about it in the past. There's some coaches in college football who, honestly, they won't watch the film afterwards. They won't watch the spring ball film. It's okay, we're moved on. And they value more what's going on in practices. Shane has admitted in the past, it'll be a question that I'll ask him leading up to the spring game this year because – Maybe his opinion has changed after being a head coach for the last couple of years. But how much value, how much stock do you put in to the actual spring game? Again, some coaches, they don't really care. We've seen players ball out in spring games in the past. We've seen guys, I mean, Jay Yurick, my goodness, what he did in the spring game a couple of years ago. I think he had almost like 100 yards, if not more than 100 yards receiving in that spring game. So I bring that up because – Beamer has said in the past, he put some stock into the spring game, but a lot more into practices. And there's some coaches that won't care at all about the spring game. So good opportunity this weekend, closed off to the media, closed off to the public. But 
a good opportunity for these players to get into that stadium on Saturday for their first scrimmage. SEC officials will be there, and they'll have an opportunity to go out there and show what they got without the coaches standing right there with them, right? Training wheels come off. You're on the field like a real game. It's not practice. The coach isn't sitting, standing 10 feet away from you. You got a ball out. You got a ball out. And certainly when you look at some of the questions with this team heading into this year, this is going to be a golden opportunity for a lot of those guys. So very excited to see what happens from the reports on Saturday, since we won't be able to be there, as well as the majority of the public. I think some parents, some uh, people that are donors, sometimes they weasel their way on in there. But for the most part, it will be closed off. Having said all that, if you have any questions, fire away. Just got an email that tomorrow's media availability with players, and those players were going to be to be announced anyway, has been canceled, reason being no players were requested. Now, obviously, with what's going on with women's basketball, you have half of the media who is typically there. They're not there because they're out in Cleveland. They were out in Albany. We'll see if they hop in and um, we're able to see what's going on with the players later on next week. But that's that's what's going on. So a little tweak to the schedule. Intern Joe's here with us. Intern Joe, good to see you, bud. Yeah, Mike, I apologize. Um, you know, was running a little late for the presser, so the, the door was You're closed. Good. And, uh, yeah, completely forgot about Tuesday since we were on Monday last week. Yeah. So my apologies. Still getting You're good. Up. everything You're good. preparing to go here. Well, probably like yourself and many people who are tuning in. This will be their first time having a chance to listen to Beamer today. We're going to play some of that. So good stuff from Shane. Good stuff from Shane. And one part that I just want to cut right to is what's going on from a quarterback standpoint, the competition at quarterback. So let's get right to that part. Let's see. Competition and besides perfection, what do you want to see from your quarterback Saturday? Uh, I wouldn't say separation. And those guys are continuing to battle. Obviously, when you talk about uh, going in the stadium and guys being able to separate themselves, that's a position that they'll all get a lot of reps on Saturday and um, a lot of reps. And they'll get an opportunity to kind of show how they handle operating the offense with the coaches not out there telling them everything and, and coaching every single rep. Uh, so I think they're, you know, some guys will there'll be some separation on Saturday, I would imagine, just because how, you know, how we're going to set it up. And, and you hope there is, but there's great competition going in there. A lot of those guys are getting reps and they're all competing and making each other better. Uh, the biggest thing, Phil, I would say is just one, how they operate. Okay. They're in the stadium now and it's a scrimmage game like setting with officials and everything. How, uh, you know, do, can, can, can guys operate? Can they, run the offense and, and communicate and the things that you have to do. And then certainly protecting the protecting the ball. They've done a really good job of that as the head coach. You know, you love it when there's a lot of turnovers from a defensive standpoint because they're taking the ball away. And then you don't like it as an offensive coach or as a head coach because the offense is turning the ball over too much. And then when the offense doesn't turn it over, you're excited for the offense, but you're like, man, we got to continue to take the ball away like we've done a great job of defensively. But the last two practices, um, we've uh, we've done a really good job offensively of uh, protecting the football. I think there was one turnover today, I didn't one interception today, but it was a ball that got kind of ricocheted, bang bang play with a receiver and a DB, and the ball popped up in the air, and and it was a DQ Smith running to the ball and made an interception. But for the most part, the quarterbacks have done a good job of making good decisions, and want to see them continue to just uh, uh, do that on Saturday for sure. So I want to pause that for a minute, Joe, because yeah. look, look, when we when we talk about what's going on in that quarterback room, and we've said this many times, even going back to the offseason, I understand the excitement about Lenora Sellers. I totally understand that. Yeah. However, as we've said many times before, even before they brought in Robbie Ashford. Even before they brought in Davis Bevel, even before Dante Reno arrived, 
if Sellers is as good as many people believe yeah. he is, then competition isn't going to change anything. If anything, competition is going to bring the best out of him. So I bring that up to say on Saturday, even though we've seen we've seen sample sizes of what Lenoris has been able to do in games going back to last year, those four games that he appeared in, even though we've seen a sample size, and even going back to last spring, we saw a sample size. If you want to include that into it. Mm-hmm. This is his this is his opportunity now is hey, keys are yours now, man. This is your opportunity. So that's not to say, that's not to say, and again, they're gonna have an opportunity to go out there this this weekend, closed off s- scrimmage, and we'll hear reports. And I'm sure, you know, between myself, Wes, and Chris, we'll dig a little deeper and we'll try to find out practically every throw and try to find out how everyone was looking, not just the surface stuff that will be given from coaches as well as players, but he has a golden opportunity, not just in the spring game, but this weekend to show, Hey, I understand what the expectations are for me this year. I understand the expectations that this fan base has for me, but I have to prove it. I did good things last year. I did good things in the spring game last year, but you know what the difference is? Spencer Rattler's not here. I'm yep. not going up against the threes, the fours, or whatever. I'm going up against the ones. So his opportunity to prove how good he is, it starts, I mean, it's already started, but it yeah. truly starts this weekend in this scrimmage. And not just Lenore's golden opportunity for Robbie Ashford, opportunity for Bevel, opportunity for Reno. But really what I'm looking at is more so Ashford, in, in sellers and how those two guys look on Saturday. And again, yeah. it's going to be more hearsay than anything else, but these are the things that I get the fan base. They'll see what happens in the spring game, but on Saturday, a lot of stock goes into these scrimmages that are played behind closed doors. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, you brought up a lot of great points there and I'm glad you did. Um, we're starting with the quarterback conversation. Cause I think it's going to be the thing that's looked into the most um, or the biggest question mark or the one with the most headlines. Um, you know, coming out of spring camp for South Carolina. But um, yeah, I think, you know, for Lenoris, right, you brought it up um, and Shane did too in his pressure. I think it was last week or it might have been week one too. Um, but he said, you know, Spencer isn't there for, for Lenoris anymore, right? He has to step mm-hmm. up into this leadership role and, you know, step into, you know, just the QB1 mentality, even though, you know, he hasn't been named the starter. Nobody has. Um, but, you know, the guy who is going to be named QB1 is the guy that's, you know, stepping up and acting like that already, right? So, um, and Shane said that, you know, kind of in, in a compliment to Lenoris, you know, that there is no Spencer and that he's started to do the right things to step up. Um, in the positions of need. So, you know, I'll be interested to watch. I don't think we'll see a whole lot. I think the quarterback battle, you know, will be more so drawn out into the summer, but I think there will be, you know, certainly a piece of the quarterback battle that will take place in the spring game. And then, you know, you, you bring up the other quarterbacks, Dante Reno, this will be a really good chance for him to, you know, show Carolina fans what he can do um, as a true freshman um, in the spring game. Cause we know, you know, the, the, the reserves and stuff, they get a lot more runs, um, in the spring game, like we'll probably see what a, a series, maybe two or three of sellers. Well, shoot, well, shoot. I mean, let's let's look at it, right? I mean, you yeah. have sellers, you have Bevel, you have Ashford, you have Reno, and then you'll see Doty in there as well. I'm sure. Absolutely. So you have five quarterbacks. So typically, typically, what we've seen in the past, you'll see teams kind of flip flop, whether it be halves, right? Um, could be a couple series. I don't know what South Carolina has planned for this one simply because when you look at how thin the quarterback rooms are right now, I mean, the room is, and I say rooms, I'm talking, you know, breaking it into teams. It's thin right now. It's thin, but we knew that going in already. But on top of that, you're going to have a guy like Luke Doty who will get a couple series for sure, but he'll also be playing wide receiver. So how much do they actually want to play him? at wide out, how much do they actually want to play him at quarterback? How much do they actually want to play him in general? Because certainly when you think of, okay, a normal quarterback, and I say normal, I'm talking about a guy that strictly just plays quarterback. A normal quarterback is only going to see the field X amount of snaps. In a lot of ways, Doty's going to see that times two. So you have to ask yourself, is it worth putting Doty out there for you know, whatever the case may be, how many snaps, is it worth it knowing that there's a possibility that you could hire the, you know, the risk of him getting injured? And I I bring that up simply because 
Yeah. It's a spring game. Okay. We've we've seen what happened. He goes back to last year. You saw what happened uh, with, with Nichols at left tackle in the spring game. Last thing you want is any injuries. So I understand it's football. It's part of the game. But in a spring game, you're trying to do everything you can to limit that. And when you're ha- when you're having a guy like Doty, God forbid, he has to go back and forth and play a, sh- a bunch of snaps. Yeah, you got to be cognitive of that. You got to be cognitive. This isn't high school, right? No, absolutely. I know there's been some players that are able to play both ways, but um, Travis Hunter over in Colorado, they practice differently. They practice differently. They practice for that. And that's not to say Doty's not, but Doty's. I mean, we're talking about offense here we're not talking about going back and forth so i don't know what the plan will be quite yet but i would expect him to be in there but to your point joe yeah you have some great opportunity i mean sellers certainly we know that certainly yep. but ashford even bevel i mean he's mm-hmm. a walk-on yeah he's getting at least from the reps that we've seen in practice he's ahead of reno right now but again like we've said before in the past and beamers talked about it since the day he's got here don't put too much stock as far as, okay, who's in what spot this yeah. early in the spring. Obviously, the fact that he's an upperclassman, I mean, what that tells me yeah. is just out of respect, you're putting him there. But, yeah, Reno's going to have an opportunity. And I can tell you, and when, shoot, you remember the interviews with Reno. Reno wants oh, yeah. to prove to people that he's not just some cheerleader. He wasn't just brought in here to help recruit players. Like, he's mm-hmm. someone – that was invited to take part in the Elite 11. He balled out this past year. He balled out the year before as well in high school. And from everyone I've spoke with, I spoke with former Gamecock quarterback and captain Perry Orth. He's had a chance to to work out with him. He says, man, his mechanics for a guy that young are very developed, very polished. But at the same time, too, he's got a nice zip on the ball. So that's another Another player certainly to look forward to as we get ready for the spring game. But again, looking forward to something we won't be able to see, which is the scrimmage on Saturday. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. And again, I think to your point too, this is a really fine tightrope that they walk in the spring game, right? With injuries, because again, you know, you don't want guys to get injured. But you know, Shane talked about it a, a little bit later in the presser um, about his quarterbacks, you know, taking contact. And I think you know he, he mentioned that that's kind of where Lenoris broke through last year. And so I think some of you know, I think Dante would be one of those guys that's eligible, you know, to to receive contact absolutely. in the spring game. Yeah, absolutely. I would I would expect them to. Right? I honestly. I honestly, when you look at it, maybe outside of Luke, just because, yeah. like I said, he's going to be juggling two positions. And mm-hmm. that's not to say, okay, he's going to be playing wide receiver the next series coming in a quarterback, but he's going to be getting hit anyway. Yeah. So why even risk it by making him live? And maybe they do. I mean, what, what the yeah. heck do I know? I'm not getting paid $5 million a year um, to be the head football coach of South Carolina. But yeah. that's what you know my thought process yeah. is. But having said all that, when you look at the quarterback room outside of Doty, outside mm-hmm. of Doty, why not? Why not? Yeah. Maybe you take it away from Bevel. I don't know. But, I mean, to me, why not make all those guys no, live? Make- or at least, at least, you don't have to make it the entire game. That's the other thing we've seen before in the past. And there's different We've levels. seen periods. We've seen periods where the quarterback is live during the uh, spring yeah. game, and then there's been some periods where they're not live. So, it's, to me, we understand with – with sellers. We know that that's a part of his game. We know that he's capable of uh, being a dynamic dual threat quarterback. We know that with Ashford, same deal, same deal. Go back and watch the tape and what he was able to do at Auburn, same deal. And then Reno, Reno might not be as athletic as sellers or Ashford, but he's also someone when you go back and you watch the tape in high school, and I know it's difficult when you compare high school to college, especially when you're talking about a freshman making the move up to the SEC, but Reno also used his legs as well. And I think it would be very beneficial for him, especially because he's a true freshman. Give give this fan base, but more importantly, your teammates and your coaching staff, a good look of what you're capable of doing when those training wheels, which are the coaches, the training wheels come off. And you're yep. on the field, the bullets are flying, it's live, and you got to go out there and you got to pick up a play. Could be third and three. Yeah. You go through your reads. All right, read one's not there, read two, read three. Maybe the check down's not there. Take off, take off, make something happen and yeah. show 
that number one, you're capable of doing that at this level, but number two, show that you got some friggin' balls too. You know, yeah. show that you got some balls. You're going up friggin' against an SEC linebacker and edge. Boom, you know, you're trying to pick up that first down because little things like that stand out to this coaching staff, stands out to your teammates. Yeah, Mike. And I mean, as 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 little it is as it is too. And I, I will say, I think Dante, you know, hasn't lost that mentality of of the hard worker based on, you know, what you said from Perry and just everything that we've heard. Um, hasn't really lost a step in the work ethic, which is great. Um, I think, you know, he's kind of sitting in that next in line, like right, he's putting himself in a position to be next in line for the throne, right? He's not the favorite, and there's still a very good chance of, you know, him, you know, possibly with 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 injuries and again, knock on wood here. But he still could see the field potentially this season. Um, but again, you know, he's doing everything he can to 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 get in that next man up mentality um, and, and doing everything right. Um, and so I think you know certainly a guy that would benefit for some for some contact in the spring game. And then also Mike too, you want to be the scout team quarterback if you're you know a guy like that, right? You you want to be or you want to have the opportunity to be able to make plays on scout team and be able to, you know, flash and, and always be in front of the coaches. It's a little my, my, minuscule thing, but I think, you know, true. It, it goes with part of earning the job, right? It's something Lenoris did last year and that's where he, well, the scout what I team. can tell, what I can tell you is, and it doesn't matter what level you are, you know, more times than not, when you come up from high school to college, regardless of the level, you're going to have to play scout. And I think, back to when I played and I can tell you from the offensive side, talking to some of my teammates and I've talked to different players at this level over the years, it's very similar, especially from an offensive standpoint. What it does is it allows you to work on things that maybe you typically wouldn't work on because your style is a certain, you play a certain style of ball. Well, if you have to mimic the opposition, whether it be, and I'm making this up, because I don't know, you know, some of the rosters right now as far as, you know, some of the guys that are going to be starting um, that South Carolina is going to be playing this year. But you look at maybe, okay, one week you got Missouri, one week you got, um, and I know they don't, play Georgia, they don't play Georgia or Florida, but you have to go up against some of these teams. The skill set, especially at the quarterback position, more than anything, you're going to have to mimic that. And what that sometimes allows you to do is it allows you to see the field in a different way, allows you to see the field. And I think with Sellers, more than anything, we heard going back to last year, Clayton White say, I mean, he was freaking balling out. He was balling out last year on scout. So whether that be Reno or not, because, again, I'm under the impression, yeah. based on the things that we've been told, based on the things we've seen in the limited practices that the media has been able to attend, that it's it's really between Sellers and Ashford at this point as far as who's going to be the week one starter. I know Beamer will not publicly say that. I know Beamer will say, well, Bevel's in there too. Reno's in. I get that. Honestly, I mentioned those two. I'm going to correct myself real quick. It's really between those two and Luke Doty too. I know they really want Luke Doty to play wide receiver, but I had this conversation with Wes Mitchell the other day. I would not rule out Doty playing quarterback. And that's not to say, okay, Mike's saying Doty's going to be the week one starter. No, no, no. What I'm trying to get at is, God forbid, God forbid they don't feel, and I say that, I'm talking to the coaching staff, God forbid they don't feel comfortable with what they're seeing. And I'm not saying there's any reason to feel that way right now. But Doty's there as well. Doty has the most experience of playing quarterback at South Carolina. Ashford certainly has a lot of experience going back to his days at Auburn. And then Sellers, redshirt freshman, appeared in four games last year. So I just bring that up because – I really think it's between those three, certainly, certainly between um, Sellers and Ashford. And I've said this before, I think it's Sellers' jobs to lose, you know? Yeah, at this point. Yeah, I, I would say so, Mike, right? And I mean, he's checking all the boxes so far so good. So I uh, hope he keeps it up throughout the spring. Yep, no question about it. Bruin Nation, good to have you on here. I know who you'll be pulling for at quarterback. And, I, again, I, there's no reason – to believe that sellers won't be ready to go. But these are the conversations that you have in the spring, because at this point, I mean, you can only say the same storyline over and over and over again. And as much as I wish we could be there Saturday to be able to watch the scrimmage, I think we'll be able to, to figure things out quickly based on some of the conversations that we have behind the scenes. And I say, we, I'm talking myself, Wes, Chris, and we'll provide you guys an update as far as how the, 
close scrimmage this weekend with SEC officials there. They'll be tackling to the ground, and uh, we'll see if they're making some of the quarterbacks live. I would expect – I would expect some of those quarterbacks to be uh, live. Yeah, I have yeah. no reason to to believe that that won't be the case. The question now becomes, how live are they? What I mean by that yeah. is, are they going to be live for you know half the scrimmage? Are they going to be live for you know is every quarterback going to be live? I mean that's kind of the stuff that I'm yeah. talking about. So we'll see. But uh, another thing too, and I want to pull this up. is Shane Beamer's thoughts on Nick Harbour. Because Nick has been juggling a lot, right? Both as a student athlete. And when I say student athlete, I'm not just talking about football. Being a student athlete with track and field, he's been doing very well in track. We've posted some of his times that he's had since he's arrived at South Carolina. He actually won the 100 meter at the – Williams Baskin Invitational about what just over a week ago. Um, he ran a 10 2 4 in the 100 meter, but he also set a personal best at that time with a 10 16. So he's doing some good things on the track. But Beamer today, this was the question that I asked him. We, Shane has talked about how he continues to come into the building whenever he can, but I feel like listening to what Shane had to say about Harbor today, number one, and we'll get into it a little bit more. Number one, if you have any, any doubt as far as, Hey, you know, why is it this guy locked in on football? This guy's locked in. He's chasing a dream because he's frigging talented as hell. He's frigging talented as hell. Of, uh, as far as track and field goes, but he wants to be a hell of a football player. And that's one of the things Beamer talked about today. So let's take a listen to what Shane had to say when talking about Nick Harbour. Shane, you kind of talked about this a couple of weeks ago with Nick Harbour, and we've seen him pop up in the limited practices that we have an opportunity to go to. There's been six. I don't, you know, you don't have to give me an exact number, but how many of those practices do you feel like he has been at? And outside of obviously his obligations, both as a student athlete, um, has he been popping up trying to catch some passes? We've heard Lenore say that they've gone out maybe twice a week obviously with there's so many new faces in the wide receiver room, yeah. just trying to develop that rapport. Do you have any idea if he's been able to do that? Yeah, I believe so in regards to he and Lenoris and, and other guys being able to do stuff on their own. He and uh, Coach Furry being able to do kind of stuff on their own within the rules and whatever Nick wants to do. But when he's – when when class isn't conflicting with his schedule, he's here. You know, so obviously the weekends – I think the last two weekends they've had track meets last week. I think they were in Florida and the weekend before they were here. So he hasn't been around on Saturdays. We weren't here this Saturday, but he hasn't really been around on the weekends. Um, and then Monday, Wednesday, Friday are days that that we meet and lift as well for the morning. So he's working around class schedule on that, but it works out pretty good for the practice days. He was here today um, as well. And, and he's adamant about being a great football player. And it's not like, when he's here, oh my God, Nick's in the building and all that. It's just what you kind of expect. And walk in, there he is, sitting in front row in the team meeting or second row in the team meeting, right in the middle, and and uh, involved. So he wants to give his all to track and, and be the very best he can be there for those guys. But then he also wants to be his very best for football and and uh, give everything he can to football. Also, so I hear that Joe, and I think the thing that stands out to me the most is Shane talking about how badly Nick wants to be great at football. And I know that might sound silly to some, but and it, and it's fair. It's fair. Some of the comments I've seen, whether it be on the message board, whether it be on social media, if he cares so much about being a great football player, shouldn't he be focused on just playing football right now? And I've gone back and forth on this. And the reason why I've gone back and forth on it is I think ultimately what it comes down to is not everyone can do what Nick Harbour is capable of doing. And what I mean by that is he's just a freak athlete. There's some people, and not just from a talent standpoint, but when you're talking about partmentalizing and being able to focus on the task at hand, wherever your feet are, 
based on every conversation I've had with anybody. And I think if you even go back during the recruiting process, you know that this kid is very smart. Never mind just how athletically gifted he is. He's a smart individual, comes from a very smart family with his mother and father just being literally geniuses in their own rights. He's a smart kid. So I think I look at that first, okay, that if he's able to take care of the school side of things, And, you know, obviously he's got high expectations for himself with what he's majoring in on top of everything else that he wants to achieve from an athletic standpoint. If he's able to take care of the academic, that's great. Okay, now he's juggling two sports. And he seems like one of those kids that just gets it, that he understands when where his feet are. But he's also able to put the extra work in. We heard from Shane talking to the quarterbacks, talking to the wide receivers, going out, doing things on his own to make sure that he's also up to par with where he needs to be from a football standpoint. Now, I would say if they were in the transition of going from one OC to another, then I can understand, okay, now he's missing this. But he's already played in this system. He's already played in this system. He's getting in shape by being out there on the track, training, running, right? So from a from a in shape standpoint, he's going to be fine. I mean, you think back to high school. That's the number one thing. And I know there's a lot of players, especially down in this state, that will play baseball. But that's the number one thing. When you look across the country, the number one thing of football players, and I know some states have spring football, some states don't have spring football. But the number one sport in the spring, if you're not playing football, is track and field for football players because it allows them to be able to stay up to speed. Lacrosse is another popular sport, depending on what part of the country you're in. So he's staying in shape. He's continuing to be at practice, continuing to take mental reps, continuing to go out on his own, working out with Harbor and some of these quarterbacks. So, excuse me, uh, Sellers, Harbor is. Mm -hmm. So he's doing things on his own to make sure that he's not falling behind. But again, he has the God-given abilities to be able to do something that very few people in the world, never mind this country, this the world, can say they've been able to do, and that's be able to compete in the Olympics, and that's a dream that he has. So, look, if Harbor goes out there and he has a tough year this year, then we revisit this conversation. We revisit it. But I think the fact that this young man has his act together – he understands how to juggle things. I think he's going to be fine. And the fact that he continues, as Beamer mentioned, we've mentioned it a couple of times from the practices that we've been at, he continues to go in there. He's in the meetings when he can be there. He's at practice, taking the mental reps. He's continuing to develop a relationship with new wide receiver coach Mike Furry. I have no reason to believe that Harbor is not going to be able to have success doing it the way that he is. But – I'd be lying if I said, yeah, every player can do this, because certainly that's not the case. We've seen players right now for South Carolina who've run track in the past who are just focusing on football right now. Some players are able to do it. Some can't. And that's OK. Nick Harbour, of course, is he's a special gifted athlete and certainly he's continuing to still earn the wide receiver position. But I um, I think he's going to be OK. I really do. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, Mike, I, and his track is going up too, right? He's making progress in track. He's hitting PRs, um, which is, I, th- I think, a good thing. If he weren't making any progress in track, I think we, it would be a different story, right? Um, we've that's seen that the other before. part of it. I'm glad yeah. you brought that up, Joe. No, yeah, because, I mean, right, we've seen that before where guys have tried to do both and then their track, like their, their times have just kind of stalled out. Um, and so then it's it's more of a focus on football. But he's making strides in track, and I think it's you know just kind of that extra work that you mentioned with Lenoris. That's going to go a long, long, long way. Um, and Oscar Attaway Jr., Mr. Attaway, nice to have you on this Tuesday afternoon. But, yeah, no, I, I think Harbaugh will be just fine. I mean, a kid that, that that's that athletic and the fact that they are working on, you know, catching and, and routes, just areas that he, you know, struggled with. It wasn't the athleticism that he struggled with last no. year. Um, so it was, it was more of just kind of the, the, you know, passing and catching and just the stuff with, uh, you know, playing both ways in high school kind of had behind him. So I, I think it'd be just fine. And take, and we've mentioned this before with players who have been hurt. 
they talk about how they're able to gain a different perspective when they're watching from the sideline. And during that time period, you're getting mental reps. Now, obviously, Harbor isn't hurt in this situation. But like an injured player, he's watching from afar. He is able to gain a different perspective that he wouldn't pick up if he was playing. Now, that's not me saying, hey, you know what? Yeah, going out there and sitting on the sideline, that's what's going to make you better in comparison to going out there and playing. I mean, players are different. There's some there's some teammates I had in college who, from a mental standpoint, they really struggled with the mental reps. They had to actually physically go out there to be able to do it. And if they failed, they failed. But they were able to actually do it, and that's how they were able to learn. I mean, think about it from a classroom standpoint. There's some people that, you know, you have a professor go up to the, the whiteboard and they try to write things out. Some people can't learn that way. They need to actually physically do the equation. So I bring that up because I think with Harbor, and the reason I brought up the academic side of it, just his his high IQ just as a person, is because if anything, I'm sure from what we've seen, he's going to be locked in to every snap, every play, especially on 11-on-11. 11 11. Um, during skeleton, when they're doing 7-on-7, seven seven, and the wide receivers – that are running the routes that he would typically run. I'm sure he's locked into it. I'm sure he's locked into it. And I think he's going to be able to find ways to continue to get better despite not being out there and physically practicing. Because again, it's not like he's just sitting around doing nothing. Right. I mean, there's guys, I'd say this, right. Look at the situation with, Rocket Sanders. Rocket Sanders has come back from an injury. And this isn't a pile on Rocket. This is just using an example here. We could use Juju. We can use anybody. Rocket's hurt right now. There's only so much that Rocket can do, right? Uh, Harbor's out there running around in track. And he's doing the same thing that Rocket's doing, which is those mental reps. He's watching. So if people are upset about Harbor, what I would say is, well, why don't you say anything about Rocket? You know, I mean, again, different circumstances, but at the same time, too, very similar, very similar. So in the sense that you're you're getting those mental reps, that's what I would say about that. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, and I think the mental reps is just kind of what Nick needs. And, you know, he, the, again, I think the track is helping. It really is. Um, and and the, the fact that he's still on pace to, to, to get to where he needs to be for the Olympics and stuff like that is is all the more the better. And. I mean, just think about it, right? If, if we're sitting here this time next summer and Nick Harbour's getting ready to go to the Olympics, how cool is that? And how, how, how nice of a, you know, ambassador um, to, to your, you know, your program and, and also your school would that be? So I, I think it's a good track. I think, you know, he's, 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 he's in a good spot. Going to listen to some running back talk here from Shane Beamer. This is what he had to say, talking about the running back room, I'm trying to remember the specific question. I think I cut it off. So. Apologies to a good friend, Jordan, at the state newspaper. But talking about the running back room, which right now it's a little thin, a little bit thinner, I should say. Rocket Sanders, we knew going into the spring that with the torn labrum, labrum, torn labrum that he suffered at the end of the season at Arkansas, had some surgery. He's making progress and is on track the way that they expected him to. But he's not practicing this spring. Juju McDowell. He re-aggravated his collarbone that he suffered an injury to in that Vanderbilt game towards the end of last season. So they're holding him out for the remainder of spring. And then we learned today that Bradley Dunn tweaked his ankle, and they're just going to be cautious, and they're going to hold him out for the rest of the spring. We found that out today from Shane. So that running back room, especially when you're talking about scholarship running backs and I'd like to do this real quick, if I could, just to give people an idea when we're talking about the scholarship running back situation. This is what we're looking at right now. So as you can see, Juju McDowell being held out. Rocket Sanders. He's continuing to come back from his injury. So you got Oscar Attaway the third. 
You got Braswell. You got Howell. And then Fuller, Matthew Fuller, is not there yet. So currently you have three scholarship running backs. And the one that you don't see up there, Bradley Dunn. But I bring that up because tremendous opportunity for those running backs right now to, I mean, I mean, shoot, especially, you know, Attaway and Howell. I've mentioned this before. I feel like with the additions at running back via the transfer portal, and certainly there should be a lot of excitement with the talent that they were able to acquire. But, and I brought this up, I think, with Shane at a press conference not too long ago, maybe just last week. I don't think people should overlook Braswell. What DJ was able to do towards the end of last season, he had to burn his red shirt because of the injuries at that running back position. The injury to, to carry on Joyner that held him out combined with Juju's injury. He had to play that extra game, that fifth game, which cost him the ability to be able to redshirt or else he would be a redshirt freshman, which was the original plan especially after the midway point of the season. That wasn't the case, but he did some great things. I think in particular the block he had in pass pro against Kentucky, which led to Spencer Rattler throwing a touchdown pass. I believe it was to Xavier Leggett. Who else would it be, right? Um, but I bring. I, I think of things like that. So obviously excited to see the new faces in that running back room, but excited to see what Braswell can do as well. Having said all that, Having said all that, let's go back over to hear what Shane had to say about the running back position. And again, question got cut off, so I don't know if it was uh, specifically about one player, two players, but this is what he had to say talking about the running backs earlier today. Uh, really been impressed with those guys. Um, you know, obviously Oscars, and so he's he's got a great you know, maturity and mindset about himself and, and all possibly get on the field. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, really been impressed with those guys. Um, you know, obviously Oscar's an older guy that's been around. So he's he's got a great, you know, maturity and mindset about himself and, and all business as well. You can tell he's played a lot of football. Jawarn obviously was a decorated player last year at South Carolina State, but you forget he's still a freshman and a year out of high school. So he's still very raw and learning, but two unique skill sets. Uh, those guys are just steady. They don't say a whole lot. They don't get too high or too low, uh, but they both, you know, we did a live five play goal line period today, offense versus defense, put the ball down on like the one yard line and a half and just, best out of five and you know they had a couple runs in there that to me showed what they're about downhill put their face in there and and um would 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 not be denied in regards to trying to get it in the end zone so like what those guys are about and and how they continue to get better and and uh both are going to be really really good players for us this season as well so there you go joe having a chance to listen to shane talk about the running backs and it's good to be able to hear that they're doing those live goal line situations and yeah. being able to see what some of these guys are capable of doing. Cause as we've mentioned before, it's not just about, okay, can a guy execute? It's does a guy have the frigging balls to be able to do it? So there's yep. no reason to believe, especially when you're talking about a guy like Oscar Attaway and you think of a guy like Howell and Rockets right in there, but obviously Rockets not at practice right now those are bruisers those guys are bruisers and they can beat you multiple ways they can run around you but they have a little pop to them because of the size they have so look we've talked about this before regardless of who's at quarterback and again i think you and i both believe it will be sellers week one regardless who's at quarterback because of the unknowns in that wide receiver room it feels like this is going to be a team that's going to run the football more than anything. Now that's not, yeah. okay. They're going to come out, run the football 40 times a game. This isn't the frigging 1980s, 40 plus 45, 50 times a game. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but this is a team. I feel like that will want to run first more than anything. And if you do have a guy like sellers out there, even a guy like Ashford, whatever the case may be because of the skill set, 
the RPO game, it continues to grow. Um, being able to have talented running backs, the RPO will open up the pass. It'll open it up. You can mix in some play action in there as well. So I, I think talking about what we're looking forward to, certainly in the spring game, but we're looking forward to as far as a report goes from this Saturday, this upcoming Saturday when they have their first scrimmage, the first live scrimmage, is that you want to see in here that the running back room did their job. Because again, with some of the question marks on offense because of inexperience, um, just from a side, whatever, whatever excuse you want to make, that running back room, there should be no excuses for that room. They should be frigging running downhill. They should be making plays, especially behind an offensive line that has a lot of experience now. That offensive line should look night and day different because of some of the experience those younger guys were able to pick up on top of some of the players they picked up in the portal, starting with Tor- Torcelli Simpkins. Looks like Joe's muted. Um, let's see if we can get Joe back. Yeah, it was it was on my mic. I apologize, Mike. wasn't paying attention. I uh, wanted to be muted for, uh, for for Shane there too. But no, I mean, so you started with the running backs there, um, and and I think you know starting with goal line is is a really good spot to figure out you know what your room is made of. You have big physical guys like Attaway and, and Howell. So I mean, the the fact that those two guys are the guys that are going right now, I think you know will we'll give you some looks. I think uh, Rocket will also give you some looks on the goal line, but I, I expect that way to be that guy. I mean, that's kind of what he was at North Texas, just really hard nosed um, runner. So uh, I, I think that's the perfect drill to put these guys through. And cause you want to know, you know, who you can rely on if you can't throw the ball in the goal line. Right. I, I think that's plain and simple. So the fact that they're doing that first um, is, is a pretty big deal for me. Um, and then uh, you touched on the wide receiver room, Larva Dane looking good. Um, and, and I think, you know, he's kind of emerging as, you know, the potential number one here. I think, you know, it's still early, right? We're still in spring ball, but Larva Dane, and we talked about, um, you know, how talented he was coming in. One of the best receivers in the Mac out of Miami of Ohio with a lot of speed. He's come in here and, and really established himself so far. So i um, interested to see, you know, what we hear out of the spring game or, or out of the first scrimmage, excuse me, on Saturday. And then, um, you know, we'll we'll see, we'll get to see, you know, what what kind of, I guess, the depth looks like at this point at wide receiver. Talked a lot about offense. We've talked a lot about defense these last couple of weeks. Haven't talked a lot about special teams. And when you think about South Carolina, especially since Shane Beamer arrived, special teams has been extremely valuable to this team. You know, I go back to that first season for the Gamecocks. They don't become bowl eligible, never mind the fact that you needed Zeb Nolan to go down to beat Vandy to get that sixth win. But they don't become bowl eligible that year, in my opinion, if they don't have the, the, the performances they got from special teams in some of those games. I mean, shoot, there's probably two, if not three games that first year they probably don't win. You look back to year two, beating Clemson, beating some of the teams at South Carolina, beat that season. Might not have been bowl eligible that year if they don't have some of the performances they did on special teams. Certainly wouldn't have been beat Clemson if they're not able to force that fumble with the way Porter was kicking that season and where South Carolina would have been put from a defensive standpoint. Uh, I think Clemson would have had the ball just over midfield, if not close to it. So I bring that up because special teams has been very valuable. And as USC transitions from the Pete Lembo era, as special teams coordinator to now the Joe D. Camillus era, there's going to be tweaks. There's going to be changes. There's going to be verbiage that's different, techniques taught differently. And just like anything in life, when you go through some type of change, it's going to take some time. It's not just going to be one of those things overnight. You just snap your fingers and everything's okay. That's the way it is. No, that's not how it works. This isn't a video game. So for the first time this spring, We've had a chance to listen to Shane Beamer talk about that process, and I thought it was just, again, unique because we haven't heard him talk about it yet, and it's something that's very important for this team, especially when you consider the fact that two seasons ago, they were the number one team in special teams when it comes to special teams efficiency. So this is what Shane had to say today about the transition with Joe D. Camillus. Shane, piggybacking off of that, whether it be the scrimmage on Saturday or just how things have been going in 
practice so far this spring. What's that transition been like with Joe DiCamillis coming in? Because, you know, maybe he has different philosophies in terms of how he wants to do things. And yeah. maybe it's trying to mesh with what you have from a philosophy standpoint. And obviously for these players, the last couple of years, they've been learning from a different coach. So what's that process been like? It's been a, uh, a learning process for sure. What he coaches, what he teaches, what he wants. And then we've tried to marry, you know, a lot of the stuff that we did here previously with Pete. Uh, there's things when I met with Joe and 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 when we hired Joe that I talked about, you know, look, I, I'm a big believer in this. You know, I want to continue to call it this, whether it be a team or a technique or a scheme or whatever it might be. But for the most part, I want him to be able to, you know, I hired him for a reason. and I want him to be able to implement him his system. And there's certainly there's a lot of carryover, but there's a lot of things um, um Technique wise that are a little bit different as well. Meetings, as I mentioned before, are intense. The practice fields intense and um, the comp the competition out there is, is really high and intense. So it's been great. Certainly high energy. I think they've connected well with Joe. He's really done a good job of connecting well with them. It's great being able to, you know, he can show, OK, we're doing this drill today and here's Aaron Donald from the L.A. Rams doing the same drill on field goal block or here is so-and-so on this kickoff cover drill that we're going to do today or whatever it might be. So being able to show NFL practice clips of here's the pros doing it and here's what we do has been good. And I think it's been a good transition. We've probably done a little bit more, um, not less drill work. We still do a lot of drill work, but probably a little bit more just 11-on-11 11 11 work in the spring. And a lot of guys are getting reps, and it's really going to be good for our just overall development, the amount of guys that are getting reps in, in a team-type setting, 11-on-11 11 11 setting. There you go, Joe. What's your thoughts on what Shane had to say there about yeah, Joe and the transition? I loved it. Um, I think it's it's always beneficial when you you know your coaches can pull up practice examples of a guy like Aaron Donald, right? I, I think that's really good. It makes it easier to absorb and um it, it lines up with everything that we've heard about Joe DiCamillis, right? Two two similar type of coaches, right? Very player friendly, very you know, player oriented good vibes in their, in their rooms. Um, so I, I think, you know, he hasn't really missed a beat now. Sure. There, there are a couple, you know, technical things that they did differently, but again, I shout out to Shane for being able to say, you know, Hey, there are a couple things language wise that we want, you know, the same and stuff like that. And, you know, coach D Camillus for, you know, sticking with that and rolling with it and, you know, continuing to, uh, you know, the continuing the, the, the legacy of Beamer ball and just kind of the, the whole aura beyond that, you know, Lembo did a great job of it. Now it's Steve Camillus's turn. And so far, so good, Mike. And the other thing too, from talking to people close to the program, the players have been really bought in to yeah. what D Camillus is doing now, obviously they loved, 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 and not that, not just them. I mean, this whole frigging city, it felt like yeah. loved Lembo. Lembo is one of a kind. There's no question about it, but Hearing from those people talk about how these players have quickly bought into what D. Camillus is trying to accomplish, it just goes to show that this guy is coming in there. And certainly when you look at his resume, right? I mean, his resume, all you got to do is stick out your friggin' hand and just show the two rings for crying out loud. But they respect the hell out of what he's been able to do. And they understand, too, and I think – We've heard this from a lot of players over the last couple of years, whether it be Jalen Brooks, whether it be Nate Atkins, whether it be for this year, when you listen to some of the players that are going through the draft process, or a guy like Marcellus Dial, even talking to DeCarry on Joyner, guys that have aspirations of playing at the next level, the importance of playing special teams. And some players that want to go play at the next level, they realize that late in their career, maybe sometimes too late, Sometimes they're able to have an opportunity like a Nick Muse where maybe you didn't play that much special teams, but then you decide to come back and you're able to ball out on special teams and you earn a spot. And now you just earned a second contract with the Minnesota Vikings. So I bring that up because I think players understand like, all right, this guy, he gets it. I mean, he, over three yeah. decades, he's been around it on the NFL level coaching special teams. So guys are bought in. You heard from Beamer, the energy's high. That's what I've been told in, in terms of talking to players um, and just people in that building and how some of those meetings have gone. So all good signs right now from a special team standpoint, which, again, it's one third of the game. But with the way South Carolina attacks it, you certainly need to make sure that that's heading in the right direction.
Yeah, absolutely. No, and again, I, I shout out to Coach D. Camillus for you know stepping up, and the guys love him, right? So far, so good. Um, and, and morale has always been high in the special teams room, but now even more so. Zachary Robinson asks, has there been any more information on Blackwell's absence from the press conference he declined last week? Is he going to be with us, or is he looking elsewhere? I'm hoping he sticks around. So Blackwell, for those of you who aren't aware of what Zachary's talking about, because some may have missed it. Markwell Blackwell was scheduled to meet with the media last, I believe it was last Thursday, last Thursday, and he declined to speak with us. The thing that was just from an optics standpoint, didn't make it look good. There were reports earlier in the week, even going back to over the weekend leading up to it, maybe that Sunday of last week, that Ohio State, after losing their running back coach, that Blackwell was one of those guys they'd be interested in talking to. Uh, that even was reported by our very own Chris Clark, who does a phenomenal job. And, and there's some other reports that were out there, but if Chris is putting it out, I take it, I take it like it's, you know, like it's a law for crying out loud. Whatever Chris says, you know, Chris is always spot on with things. So from an optics standpoint, it didn't look good because he declined to speak. He was at practice that day. He's been at practice since then. Obviously, they had Easter break over the weekend, but he was at practice today, was in the building today. Nothing right now makes me believe that he's going to be leaving. And I think more than anything, it was just a poor look from an optics standpoint. I don't know why he chose not to. I can make assumptions as to why he didn't. We just weren't given a reason, you know, I think actually Hale McGranahan of the Big Spur actually asked, was there a reason why he's not speaking today? And sometimes they'll be like, all right, you know, they have a meeting or this or that. So I understand why the fan base got all worked up or I didn't say the entire fan base portion. I understand just from the way it looked from an optic standpoint, but that's why we came on on Thursday. I said, I'm not going to make any assumptions yet. I'm not going to jump to conclusions. I just think it's just, just chose not to speak to the media for whatever reason. And we put it out on Twitter that he declined because I know some people are looking forward to hearing him speak. So, you know, that wasn't to create a, uh, a wave of worry. It was more so just to inform people who were looking forward to hearing from him. Like, Hey, you know, if you're sticking around trying to wait for Blackwell to speak, unfortunately that's not the case. You know, he declined to speak with the media. So, I don't know if we'll have a chance to, to hear from him. I've mentioned this before, even going back to last Thursday, Joe, that all the Ohio State stuff aside, which, again, I think at this point, I think everything's fine. I think he'll be here. But that aside, I want to hear from Blackwell. We heard from Beamer today yeah. talking about the running backs, but I want to talk to the man who is around those guys more than Beamer, and that's the positional coach. I want to know what he's seeing from these players. I want to know what he's seeing from Oscar Attaway the third. I want to to hear from him what Hal's doing as he makes his transition from SC State to SEC football. I want to hear how Bradwell's uh, Braswell is growing as he makes that transition into year number two. And some of the, uh, the other running backs in that room who may be walk-ons. I want to hear that. That's what I want to hear. So we'll wait and see. We'll wait and see. Uh, Travis says Big Tree had a bit, a bit of a cryptic tweet. Was that a big nothing burger? I haven't seen it, Travis. Um, we've seen cryptic. Put it this way: we've seen cryptic tweets in the past from Big Tree, and from everyone I've talked to um, in the past about it. What they always tell me is, "Oh, that's just Big Tree." Yeah, I I, I know what he's talking about, and I, I I I think it's just Tree. I mean, I think it might have been a little bit of an up and down, but I think that's just Tree. I don't. I mean, I don't know. Um, but yeah, no, I, I know what you're talking about. I don't think there's any reason to be concerned uh, not that i know of at least doing a little bit of digging on it but um Do we yeah. have the actual i'm gonna try to see if i can pull the actual tweet, there's a tweet and then an instagram story um i i thought you had known about this mike my bad so i don't see anything on might have deleted Twitter it right now so um yeah i'm assuming I, yeah it's just, i'll say this no. you know I, i'll say this from everything I've been told in the past, anytime that 
tree tweets anything that's cryptic people just tell me oh yeah there's nothing there that's just that's yeah. just big tree like you know I'm like is he okay sure. and they're just like yeah he's fine like that's just you know I don't want to say like a space kid. All life is an offensive lineman, Mike. Oh, a lot of ups and downs. Not really getting. Uh, it was an April. Yeah. Was, oh, JJ was says it was an April Fool's. See, it was an April exactly. Fool's like week. I was like, I, I yeah. That's why. Yeah. That's why. I mean, I didn't even. I didn't even see it, JJ. I, but if, if, um, and I'm glad he brought that up because again, it's not even on there. But I've just some of the tweets in the past from him. Again, people just tell me in that building. Yeah, don't worry. This is big three. That's tree. just big tree. Yeah. That's what makes big tree that's, big tree. Yeah, that's so what makes him tree. It doesn't yeah. surprise. <laughs> Without even knowing what the hell yeah, because I, did, I, I definitely reached out about it, and the people I reached out to didn't. I mean, they're like, ah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, yeah without even knowing what the heck no it is, I, mean, on it I wouldn't okay. even have to like, see it, and I'd like, be like, all right, yeah, that's just would have been nice tree. to know. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. But, uh, all right, Travis says first. Chris Clark and West didn't come out with anything. I kind of thought it was a joke. Yeah, see, yeah. I had I hadn't even heard about it. this. Is the first I'm hearing about it. So, yeah. No, Having no. said all that, though, I'll tell you what's not a joke. It's April second, and I just got my taxes done. So I, I mean, I'm giving myself a pat on the back. Hell of a job in comparison to where I was last year. But if you aren't there quite yet, or you're like in oh crap mode, Joe, who can they call? Well, if you couldn't tell already, our good friends over at Liberty Tax, they're on your screen right now. Tax ID is that uncertain feeling you get right before doing your taxes, but you don't have to go through it alone. The tax team at Liberty Tax and Irmo, Lexington, and Columbia will walk you through the process, clear up any confusion, and guarantee you'll get the biggest possible refund or your money back. It's tax time. If you're in a hurry for a refund, call on the tax team at Liberty Tax. They're fast, accurate, and guaranteed. On the other hand, if you think you might be on Uncle Sam, talk to the Liberty Tax team to make sure you're not paying more than you should owe. They'll find every possible deduction for you. Locally owned and operated staff by tax professionals from your neighborhood. Open 9 to 9 on weekdays and 9 to 5 on Saturdays with multiple service options. Start through the Liberty Tax mobile app or through their desktop portal. Make an appointment or just walk in give a call to upload your tax documents. And when you come in, your return will be ready to view and sign. Give them a call on your screen right now. And for those listening, 803-462-5576. Once again, 803-462-5576 for all of your tax needs this tax season, Mike. And today's show is also brought to you by our good friend Clint Hammond of Movement Mortgage. Talking to a lot of people over the last week or so, you know, I don't know if it's the weather. I don't know if it's the flowers coming up. I don't know what it is. People are like, you know what? I'm thinking about buying a home. I'm thinking about moving locations. I'm thinking about doing this, doing that. Well, it is a perfect time to be able to do it. Weather's starting to get nice. And guess what? Some of those rates are starting to dip. If you've been interested in purchasing a home over the last two years, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, if you're looking for the lowest rate in the market, you're looking to make that process easier. Do exactly what our very own Wes Mitchell, as well as former Gamecock quarterback and captain Perry Orth both did when both of them were looking for homes. They gave Clint a call over at the Movement Mortgage. That number, 803-771-6933. If you missed any of our show, head on over to the Gamecock Central YouTube page where you can watch this show in its entirety. And if you're not already a subscriber for free, on the Gamecock Central YouTube page. Make sure you hit that little bell. Hit the little ding. ding so you get notified every time one of these shows drop, as well as any other Gamecock Central videos that are uploaded. Or if you're a podcast listener, head on over to the Gamecock Central Podcast Network where you can listen to shows like this, as well as the Garnet Trust Takeover Hour at 107.5 The Game and the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. we got plenty of takeover hours now, it feels like, on 107.5 The Game. Gets all uploaded to the Gamecock Central Podcast Network. He's intern Joe. I'm Mike Yub. Appreciate you guys tuning in. Congrats to Don Staley and the women's basketball team advancing to their fourth straight Final Four. Just saw some videos. They have arrived in the land, that land being Cleveland, Ohio. Good luck to them this weekend as they look to advance to another national championship, try to bring home a third title in program history. Appreciate everyone that tuned in. Enjoy the rest of your week. We'll catch you Thursday. You see live again.